Want to know what the movers and shakers of New Hampshire's performing arts are thinking? Welcome to New Hampshire Unscripted with your host, Ray Dudley. This is Ray Dudley, Artistic Director for Square Peg Productions. And in this episode, I sit with the august Michael Curtis. This is a long one, but there is so much information in here. Just some of the subjects we touched on were, what was the first play to really hook him on theater? Are there too many theaters in New Hampshire right now? Should we subsidize the arts or let the market pick the winners and losers? Changing times and changing demographics that forced the little church there to close its doors. We touch on the story of 86-year-old Marianne Thebus reading from her script while on stage about what the heck is going on with To Kill a Mockingbird on Broadway. Michael talks of his great love for David Mamet, or not. He speaks about what he's looking forward to this year and how he would love to see a full-time regional theater in New Hampshire. And then Michael tells us of his next project, which will probably be him directing The Women of Lockerbie at Bedford Off Broadway. And then finally, he leaves us with some words of advice. A great show coming up. Take a listen. Do you have anything you want to talk about that is on your mind? Can't think of anything. Off. You can't. No, but funny. Uh, I was on your Facebook page. I, <laughs> I found a ton. I found a ton. Good. That's where I leave all my best work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before we actually get into a lot of this, and, and there's some really cool stuff here. I want to pick your brain about. Yeah, sure. I was looking over your information you sent me. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, and uh, that way I don't have to read it and bore them. Okay. I brought it too. You did. Fire away. <laughs> I was born and raised in New Hampshire. Okay. Yeah. Skipped around a little bit, uh, lived in Boston, uh, lived out in California for a little while. Always seemed to come back here and came back uh, permanently in the uh, tr- probably late 80s and uh, haven't left the state since. Educated in New Hampshire as well, Plymouth State College, two years. Most of my family is within a reasonable drive, so I have always been an unrepentant Granite Stater. And probably uh, will continue to be. Studied theater while I was at Plymouth State with uh, some really great professors. Charles Combs was there when I was there, and he was uh, my mentor and my inspiration. In fact, he's the one that got me into studying theater. I was uh, working with a bunch of kids at a school program in Hanover, New Hampshire. And he was friends with the teacher who was advising the program and who I was working with. And he uh, came to see one of our productions and he said, uh, what are you doing after this? And I said, uh, you know, I'm just kind of hanging out and going to work and maybe try to pick up another program somewhere. And he said, you ever thought about studying theater? And he said, I'm the professor of theater at Plymouth State College, and uh, you should come over and take a look. It's not a big program, and it wasn't back then. It wasn't the university it is now. In fact, the building itself, uh, Silver Hall, was uh, a converted gym. They did some amazing stuff in that building. Our dressing rooms were the old showers that they just took out all the fixtures. and <laughs> <laughs> But Jeez. the tile walls were still there. No and, uh, kidding. Yeah, but it was a great place. Uh, we, we loved it. It was, uh, it was very secondhand at the time, but uh, we managed to do some incredible incredible things there. That was in the 70s, wasn't it? Uh, when did you- Early 80s. Okay. Yeah, 82 to 84 is when I, when I went. Unfortunately, I was not able to finish. Um, ran out of money. I was uh, paying for it myself and wasn't able to uh, keep up with the, uh, the demands of trying to do a, you know work and school at the same time. So I uh, finished two years and then always hoped that I would go back and uh, thus far have not yet made it. There's still time. There is. There is. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm only 58. So I'm still young. So, uh, but in the man in, in the uh, interim between going to school, I've managed to bang out pretty impressive resume. I yeah, think I in terms so. of uh, theater. How many pages long is it there, Ray? Like Plenty. three. Plenty. <laughs> My printer thought I was crazy. I've done a little bit of everything in theater. A uh, lot of directing. Yeah, actor, director, director, teacher, adjudicator, theater critic, and pretty much. Self-appointed advocate for all things theater here in the Grand State. So you acquired this love for theater. Yeah. It, it, 
do you still have it? And and what was the hook? What what do you, what is it that about live theater that really pulled you in? You know, I think as as a kid, I I wouldn't have been able to really quantify it, and that's when I started when I was like fifteen, and I think I did it for a lot of the reasons that people do it at that age when that's um, just for the experience and because it looks fun and some of the cool people that you hang around with are doing it and they inspire you to do it and things like that. But I've come to realize in the course of what I do now, especially um, as a freelance theater critic and and an arts advocate for the state, is um, I love things that tell a great story. And I like being a part of that, not necessarily on the production end, but as a recipient, as an audience member, I like having someone translate a really good story and find a way to give it back to the audience. Do you recall the first show that you saw that really, it, it, it was the one that hooked you? Um, I do, and people are going to laugh, but it was uh, in college and it was, um, we went on a field trip to Boston as part of our college uh, practicum, and it was Cats. No kidding. <laughs> it was Cats. It was playing at uh, the, one of the big theaters in Boston. And uh, But prior to that, we had toured Boston University's theater department, which, of course, is massive. And they, uh, they gave us a tour of the place and showed us everything. And you just couldn't help but be in awe of what was possible with all these different tools of the trade. And then after the tour, we went to the theater and we saw Cats. And it was incredible. We're talking 1983, Mm -hmm. I think, at the time. So, I mean, in terms of the technology then, as opposed to the technology now, it would probably be considered primitive. But all the you know, smoke and the things rising and the lights and the singing and the dancing and, and everything. It was just incredible. So that's what really lit the fire. I remember the first one that I ever saw, I, I had started theater in high school and it was just like a senior class play kind of thing. And there was a drama club, but it wasn't really a, much of a club. But we got a chance to go to a small theater in North Reading, Mass. And it was like a night of one acts, I think. And I saw a scene from Night of the Iguana, and I swear I stopped breathing. It, I could not believe it. It's so vivid in my memory today. I swear to you, I could feel the humidity of the jungle just sitting there watching sure, this piece. Sure. It, it so hooked me. I could not believe yeah. what I was, because I had never seen stage theater before. You know, what we were doing, you don't see yourself, so you don't really right, see what's going on. Course. And so I sat there and watched this piece, and I was just, I was so captivated. This guy had just taken me away the, playing this preacher. It, it was, well, here I am, 64, mm-hmm. and I'm still railing about it. You mm-hmm. know, it, it, it was that hooking. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean by the great stories. Yes. We all know, we all have our favorite playwrights, and we don't even have to list them. But Tennessee Williams was a great storyteller. He knew how to, I think the, I think playwrights like Williams are, they're less craftsmen and more a conduit to the greater experience of humankind. And they find a way to distill the essence of that experience into a really terrific story and then yeah. give it back in such a way that this uh, many years after seeing it, you're still, the experience is still vivid for you. I think Shepard is another one who, Absolutely. who can do that. He can Absolutely. really pull it down to its bare minimum stuff and yes. just throw it back out there. And it's just raw. Yes. His stuff is just raw. Absolutely. How do you see theater in New Hampshire at this point? It's kind of evolved a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember back in the 80s, kind of, there were many groups. There was like the community players, Mm. something in Manchester. But Mm. nowadays, uh, there's got to be over 200 groups out there. There's uh, approximately, I did a count um, on my... uh on my Facebook page, uh, The Granite Stage, there's a pinned post, and it's called The Big List. And it lists all the current working theater companies in the state, professional and community, and youth. We don't count all of the uh, you know, colleges or high schools and things like that, and there are well over 100, well over 100. And, that, and if you did include all of the programs and all of the schools and et cetera, it probably would be well over 200. What's your feeling with the quality of theater that's out there right now? Um, I think it's it's fairly consistent. I think it's fairly good. 
I think New Hampshire is still a little bit behind the curve in terms of what it's willing to allow itself to do in, in terms way? of the types of theater that are out there, although that is also part of the evolutionary process. I think New Hampshire theater as a whole tends to try to go for the big shows or the well-known shows first rather than taking more of a chance on the lesser known things or the experimental things or the plays that are we had a thread going on the grand stage about this uh, not too long ago and i had pointed out i said that i think new hampshire is a little bit too um stuck in producing plays written by white men that star white men as mm. the, you know, as the hero. And uh, you see a lot of that still, although it's getting better. There are companies in and around the state that try to do more things by women playwrights like Lauren Gunderson and uh, or trans playwrights or playwrights of color and try to weave a little bit more of the human experience into what it is that they offer. Now, I know that these companies have to make a dollar in order to to survive. Um, so right. they have to try to make try to find that balance between you know the, the stuff that's popular and and quote safe unquote and the stuff that's maybe a little bit more of a risk for them creatively and financially. Mm. You're right, though. The, there's that dollar trade-off that just sits there, mm -hmm. really in the in the back of everyone's head. They can either do Annie and mm -hmm. make a bazillion dollars, or they can try to do something a little bit edgier. I think it's one of the things I like about groups like Kapow. Yeah, they you do not find them. Yeah, uh, groups like Kapow, Hatbox Theater, and Players Ring, I think, are my top three in terms of groups that are willing to to take a risk uh, and invest more into the the process of finding playwrights or nurturing playwrights that are a little bit outside of the the normal circle of of what is known mm -hmm. with the proliferation of groups and maybe we haven't reached peak groups yet but i've often wondered do you think that there's a risk of these there seems to be a new group popping up, I swear, every week of cannibalizing audiences and cannibalizing sales. And, no, and why I that? don't. I think that anybody that wants to try to uh, get a theater group up and running should do it. I think that what will happen is that two things will happen. Either they'll succeed or they'll flame out uh, relatively quickly. Um, but there's no such thing as stealing an audience. An audience knows what it wants. It knows that it either wants something like theatrical comfort food like Annie or things like that, or it wants something a little different. It wants to taste something different. Its palate is ready for something else. Hmm. So as many theater groups that want to, definitely give it a try. And yes, there have been a, a few theater companies that have popped up, but probably just as many that have closed down. They last, the, the average, uh, I read a, an article one time, the average life expectancy of, of a community theater group now is about that of the average sitcom, which is about really? seven years. Oh my God. Yeah. So if they're doing something right, they're going to last. They're going to, if they, if they hang their hook on a concept, like say Kapow does, or Hatbox does, or Players Ring does, mm -hmm. or any company for that matter, they're going to last. They're going to keep going. If they if they find themselves just kind of casting about, looking for their, their raison d'etre, as it were, um, they are likely to just kind of fade away. So, And that's good. I mean, as much as New Hampshire can sustain as much theater that gets thrown at it, it's also good for things to rotate in and out and change up. So it's it's good when uh, some of the groups uh, don't quite make the grade, whereas other groups that have a good concept kind of rise to the top. Boy, this is an interesting discussion because I know that there are parties who are used to government funding. Yeah. England. Uh, sure. You know. So this is a very interesting topic to me because on one hand we're talking the market will take play will take care of it will but if you subsidize it you take the market out of it then you can have groups that are doing 
mediocre stuff forever and ever. Sure. Because they're subsidized. Right. And shouldn't be there. True. We don't really have that problem here in right. the United States, unfortunately. We, we don't get a lot of funding. We don't get a lot of support from our government. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because theater companies especially have had to find ways to come at the uh, concept of funding pretty much by themselves. And th- these are the things that give rise to applications like crowdfunding which um, has become almost institutionalized now. If you're going to do a production, you start crowdfunding prior to the production so that you can raise the money to do the production. And I think that's a really great model. You also get an indicator of how many people are actually interested in seeing the type of work you want to do because if you put a crowdfunding uh, request out there and you get thousand dollars on the first day that's a pretty good indication that people are really interested in what it is you want to do if you put the same request out and you get a dollar in the course of three weeks then that might be an indication that people uh, either aren't ready to uh, see your type of theater or are sick of it mm-hmm. yeah i think it also weeds out lazy people right? it does because it does of the, the work involved in having to do it you can't be lazy and do theater boy that's a truth. you can't is the you could be all kinds of other things, but you can't be lazy. <laughs> it's funny we talk about groups that maybe go under. Lately, you had a couple of posts about like Little Church Theater and yeah. all this. And I was I, really was, sad to hear about them. Talk a little bit about what's happening there. I think uh, with Little Church Theater, I had heard from a source that they were closing, and I had no idea that they had actually closed the prior season uh, because they run their season from about Memorial Day to Labor Day or or thereabouts, you know, late spring to early fall. Mm -hmm. And they they are seasonal. The building is seasonal. It's shut down uh, in the winter. I I got a response from a person because I was basically putting a, a request out for information on who was doing what in the coming summer season. And they do several productions there at Little Church. So this gentleman pinged me and he said, "Uh, just so you know, they're closed. And I go, really? And so I put out some feelers and I got collaboration from some other people that they were closed that had people that had worked directly with the company and and had better knowledge than this gentleman did. And they verified that it was closed. And it wasn't because of laziness and it wasn't because of lack of funds and it wasn't because of anything that they had done wrong it was just that the the model that they used for funding the company or the organization i think was pretty much self-funded the the building had been purchased by a couple and then they converted the old it was an old church or a chapel that um, the catholic church had erected in the in the 19th 19th century or the early 20th century, specifically to cater to the faithful that summered Mm -hmm. on Squam Lake, uh, which is a cool bit of history. But they kept the building pretty much intact. It was a beautiful little chapel-like building with um, uh, stained glass windows and a little tiny stage. It used to be the pulpit. And you've been there, I'm sure. Yeah, And the pews are still, yeah, you performed there. The pews are still in. Yeah, that's cool. You know, it's it's pretty much like it was when it was first built. So they were, you know, faithful to the history and all that stuff. And they did some great programs. They did, uh, I remember going to see rumors up there and thinking, how are they ever going to put rumors on on a stage like that with all the doors and the comings and yeah. the going, and they did it, and it was fantastic. No yeah, it was an absolute, I adjudicated that when I was an adjudicator for the New Hampshire Theater Awards, and uh, it was one of the best productions I've seen. So it they had to get really into it. I don't mean to break off no, your, they were, so they, that's, they, you know, they I've, did, having been there, that place is crazy They small. did full stage, fully staged productions, they did concerts, they did uh, weddings. They had fashion shows. Fashion there? shows, art shows. They did a little bit of everything. And I think what happened is that as they were tending to their little patch of culture there in Holderness, culture grew up around them. So many venues came online in the interim, and they were so close. And I just think that in the end, they because they were seasonal mm. and 
because their model was based on a few faithful contributors and subscribers that summered there and then probably just eventually moved on as people do. They just the model was just not sustainable, and so they made the decision to close their doors. That's a shame. I know they they sold out a lot of shows. They did. They had a very loyal fan base. Yes, they did. A lot of a lot of the summer people that yeah. they came up there, and I think that's you know when the economy shifts to theater is directly impacted by that. I th- think a lot of the people that may have summered up there when they first started out weren't there as time went by. They probably sold their cottages or their kids inherited them and they may not have been as plugged into the summer culture as their parents or grandparents Great were. Great point. So if, if the model's not sustainable, then you either have to change the model yeah. or you have to Make the decision to close your and doors. And it can't be easy. No, right? it to, can't To be. go back through and try to redo the, all the financials and yeah. try to figure out. Fundraising itself is brutal. It is. Just can't imagine having to try to do it on your own. Yeah. You know, the model in theater is adapt or die. Yeah. Just right. like anything. Just like anything. So. And it's a gamble. You never know what show is going to take off and, and you help really you don't. out. I've talked with Neil Pankhurst up there at the sure. Winnie, and he said he scratches his head. Yep. A show which he thinks is going to be a, a blockbuster and bring mm-hmm. people in is a snoozer, and they can't figure it out. And then yep. shows which they thought were just going to be sleepers, and they snuck it in. Yep. Turns out that they sell them out. Yes. I don't it's, want to say it's a crapshoot or a roulette shoot, is. but you know. It is, and that's part of the allure, I think, with doing theater is that as a person that's directly invested in it, like a, a theater administrator or an artistic director or, or anybody who works directly in theater, every day is you're kind of embracing the unknown in terms of, is this going to work? Is this is this thing that I'm doing going to have the desired effect? And you can never, never guarantee with with any degree of accuracy right. what's what your audience is going to take away having been to the hat box yeah multiple times it really thrills me to see what productions are being done by local people mm. we have a lot of i'm going to just call them untapped talent but at least they're out there like matt gaskill we've got the writers group mm-hmm. with uh, like george kelly and his mm-hmm. group there all putting these things out and the hat box is perfect for that. Yeah. They're, they're not risking having to sell 700 seats. It's wonderful to watch the quality that can come from some of those shows mm-hmm. that aren't getting back to the the thing about Annie versus Cutting Edge. Well, you know? that's the other thing about theater in New Hampshire is that a lot of it is done in really big, huge spaces, either auditoriums or converted gyms or rented places yeah. or just big old el- white elephants. Theaters the Audi, that, that right? are wonderful and palatial right. and gorgeous and stuff, but there's that literal distance between the audience and the the people on stage. And what I like about Hatbox is that it uh, brings a level of intimacy which you don't tend to find on the proscenium stages that are proliferated throughout the state. So yeah. uh, the audience is pulled in on a level that they don't anticipate when they're literally sitting two feet from the action. And uh, I think it really kind of uh, energizes the risk takers. Yes. Which is wonderful. It does. Be- the, Go ahead. Yeah, the, the, uh, because the people that are on stage or the people that are producing the play can gauge a reaction, the, the immediacy of the reaction, the, the intensity of the reaction, because it's right there. It's yeah. right there. The thing about Hatbox versus, say, the Audi is the Hatbox, the audience is almost a part of the play. Yes. Whereas you go to the Audi, you're just viewing a play. Yeah. And I think that's what you meant by distance. There. Yes. Um, there's just, a stage yeah. at the Audi, and then there's the audience, and then there's that gulf, that invisible gulf in between. There's almost, I don't know, 10 feet between the first row, maybe a little bit more. There's an orchestra pit there. Yeah, right. So, I mean, it's, it's not used a lot, but still, it's it's a physical barrier, and it, it's also a mental barrier. Yeah. So and the sound can be can be changing right as well. Oh, don't I mean, get me started. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the great thing about the hat box and the players' ring, places like that, is you don't need to be mic'd. No, you can hear people practically breathing. That's one of my bugaboos: is that these companies that do a lot of uh, musicals and and do them in the big spaces, even places that aren't that big, like the Derry Opera House, they feel like they've got to mic everybody 
uh, Seven Ways to Sunday. And one thing that really, really irritates me as an audience member is seeing a period play, like say Oklahoma, and they come out and they've got the microphone taped to the side of their face all the way down to their mouth. That's just... And you want me to suspend my level of disbelief? Okay. It pulls me out instantly. It does. It does. It's a pet peeve of mine. The best technology is never seen. It's experienced, but it's not seen. I mean, obviously, lighting is seen. The set is seen, things like that. But the best technology to support a play like sound. Don't want to see people with bulging mic packs and uh, microphones uh, taped to the side of their faces. And I think, you know, I don't want to indict our sound people who are only work with what they've got. But I think it's lazy. I think it's lazy, and I think they just uh, they just do it because it's the easy way to do it. And I'm telling all sound designers in the state now, you're on notice. Find a better way. I've said it for years, so they're not really on notice. I believe it. Plus, if it's not done well, the sound does not come out as natural. No. It makes me bleed from the eyes almost mm-hmm. to be sitting as an audience member, looking at someone on stage but hearing the sound behind me. Correct. Correct. It, that is irritating. Or, yeah, yeah. Or the delay, you know, where the person's speaking, but the sound comes out like a, a millisecond later yeah. or something like that. But to be fair, on the other hand, uh, with advances in sound and uh, innovations in, in the way that people manipulate sound, there are some really great sound designers in the state. Uh, Rich Loomer, who works with Peacock Players, uh, does a lot of really great stuff with sound. Neil Pankhurst designs wonderful soundscapes for the productions that he's involved in. Clint does uh, some uh, Clint, yeah. Clint Close yeah. Um, and Andrew Pennard oh, is yeah. another. So uh, shout out to all all of the sound designers who literally are adding another dimension yeah. to their productions. You don't think of that as being an art or a craft. Oh, you just kind of is. take it for advantage it that is. it's there, right? It is. It's as much. It's as much of a craft as um, as lighting or scenic Costumes design design. or costume yeah. or, or anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is, and it needs to be recognized better. There should be an award for it. Actually, get on that NHTA. I wanted to ask you. There's some crazy stuff happening in theater, both on Broadway Mm. and all around us. Can you touch on this article about Mary Ann Thebus, the 86-year-old woman? Yeah. So tell us about that, and then give me your opinion about that. So this critic uh, went to a play where the uh, actress uh, Mary Ann Thebus, this is, I believe, in Chicago. Chicago, yep. uh, A critic went to see a play that she was in. And noticed that she was reading from the script on stage. And he inquired around, and apparently she had been on some kind of medication that was affecting her memory. And this lady's 86 years old, and she's uh, she's considered a living treasure in the Chicago theater. And he agonized over whether or not to call it out, how to call it out, maybe to bring... Uh, attention to the extenuating circumstances, trying to figure out a way to maybe put the theater on notice that it had been noticed, and without necessarily shaming the actor herself. And he ended up writing a kind of a hybrid uh, review of the show and kind of uh, outlined his own feelings about how he felt about seeing a woman that he respected and admired, an actor and an artist that uh, was very much uh, held in high esteem, reduced to reading from a script and uh, how conflicted he felt about it. And so he wrote the article. He called them out. In my opinion, I read the article. I don't think he he shamed the actress. She may have felt that... uh, he called her out, but I don't believe he did. I believe that he was just trying to bring uh, attention to the fact that sometimes you notice your heroes have feet of clay, and sometimes you have to say something, and sometimes you don't, and where's the value? And I think that's what his article was about. And there was some pushback. Um, there yeah. was a, a couple of articles written um, after his article uh, dropped, and he was accused of white privilege and and ageism and right. things like that. And I just think that in a situation like that, there's no way to win anything. But do you still write the article that you need to write? Because it's his job. I mean, he's a theater critic. That's his job. That's what he gets paid to do. 
So how does he do it in a way that shows compassion, but also just kind of says, I noticed this and it bothered me. And I think he put the theater on notice. I I don't know if it was necessarily a bad idea for them to go ahead with the actress in the role, knowing that she was compromised because she clearly... Anybody who has to go on stage with a script in their hand in a fully-fledged production is not at the top of their game and is not giving the best performance that they want they to can't. give. They can't. So they can't what, give it. what decision do you make? Yeah. So it's really hard to... I feel for the, th- the critic and I feel for the theater and I feel for the actors. I think they all got kind of caught in a cascade of decisions that moved forward and put them in the positions that they ended up in. I really wanted your opinion on it, and I I really want to flesh it out even a little bit more. Sure. Because let's say nobody talks about it, Mm. and I don't know this woman, right? Let's say I just want to go see a play as an Mm -hmm. audience member. Mm -hmm. I show up. I'm sure they're paying pretty good money for a a seat. Yeah. I show up, and the first thing I see is a woman reading from the script. What am I supposed to think? I'm thinking, this is unfinished. This is something's not right here. So I think in a way he's obligated to have to at least bring it up yeah. if the theater maybe didn't warn me going in. Sure. But if I'm paying top dollar for uh, what I expect to be a professional play, uh, somebody owes me an explanation or an apology. Or well, I think that's the case regardless of what level of theater you're seeing, whether it's community or professional. You go expecting to see a story being told. You don't go to see a, a reading of that story. Right. It's, well you put. go to see a live interpretation of that. So if your expectations aren't met, you are owed an explanation, I, I believe. I get that it's tough. Yeah. Nobody wants to be called out. Nope. But I think in this case, this is why I really wanted you to, to talk about it was mm-hmm. because from your point of view, I wanted to see what you thought, how you would have uh, handled the situation. Would you have done the same thing yes, that he did? I would have. You would have called it out. I would have called it out. I would have also tried to balance it with compassion, uh, especially, I mean, I'm, I'm one of them. I mean, I'm an older person now. I'm 58, and I have a better understanding of some of the struggles that, that older people go through in terms of negotiating the day-to-day yeah. challenges of life, both on the stage and off. And I think that, and I'm friends with a lot of these people as well, and it would be very tough I don't know if I would give them a heads up about it. I would just say, I, I got to write about this. I got to let people know that, because that's my job, is to let people know what I've seen and to be honest about it. But I want to find a way to kind of lessen the sting because you know that person that's up there and struggling is already f- feeling their absolute worst and you don't want to contribute to that. You don't want to add any fuel to the fire if you can possibly help it. And I think that's probably what a lot of the backlash was about, was that uh, people were sticking up for this actress and with good reason. And it's nice to know that she has such a fan base. And, you know, people are saying, well, I'm going to go and see her. I don't care if she, you know, sits in a chair and reads the whole darn thing. But um, I think the guy did the right thing. And because without the truth tellers, you you lose the integrity. And that's true in everything, but especially so much in theater. Yeah. And that's one of the jobs of a theater critics is to tell the truth. There's a, there's a great, <laughs> there's a, in fact, there's a great quote by uh, Frank Norris who wrote a book, the name of which I can't remember, McTeague. And I think he wrote it in the 20s. And there's a great quote in, by the main character who says, I, I didn't lie, I didn't truck with the facts, I told the truth. And that uh, quote has always stuck with me uh, about, uh, you know, especially when it comes to doing theater. You want to try to find the balance. You want to try to find the compassion. You want to try to find a way to not shame the person uh, because they're already feeling pretty darn bad. But you want to find a way to say this was noticed. And in terms of what we expect from theater, this is not acceptable. I think it's it's an injustice to try to pretend that it's not happening, yeah. right? I mean, because that's kind of how, how he got caught off guard. Sure. She knew she was off on book. Mm-hmm. The company knew she was on book. And all of a sudden, they're like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. Well, yeah. 
So, and Did I, you overlook that? Yeah. It's like, no, I really can't. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> How do I overlook it? I mean, you know, not write about the woman? And so-and-so appeared in the play. Yeah. And it's like, the, what are you hiding? Then you become complicit. You know, then you then you become complicit in the lessening of the experience. Yes, that's my point. Is, yes. Yeah, and it, it, yeah. it's just an injustice. Yeah. It's funny, I was reading about some of these film stars who moved to Broadway mm -hmm. and have to have help, like mm -hmm. Pacino mm -hmm. and some of these guys who end up having to have little monitors or, or mm -hmm. stuff on the back of furniture sure. so they can read their lines. Um, there has been a great deal of controversy lately about some of the, you know, the Hollywood actors that have uh, either transitioned to stage or started out in stage, gone to Hollywood and then come back to it. Bruce Willis was called out uh, for wearing earpieces and having his lines fed to him. And the theater itself and the organization which produced the play, I can't remember which play it was, but uh, I do remember the controversy that kind of flamed up over it. Yeah. And yeah, Pacino's been known to uh, kind of put monitors in uh, various strategic locations. And I'm sure that there are other um, tricks of the trade that uh, they use. And I really don't know what to say except that if you've got i know you've got a name actor that brings in the box office but if they're not doing the job they're not doing the job and that is the job you know that's called the law of diminishing returns if you bring up a substandard actor he's going to do a substandard play and people are going to expect that level of substandard performance right. and it goes on and on and on it's like how much it's a slippery slope where do you where do you draw the line i'm not sure who's in our audience or who's listening to this <laughs> at all. But one of the things that maybe they don't understand is if you're on book or you don't know your lines, there's no way you can be 100% engaged in the scene. No. And that's part of the problem. That's right. You can't, you cannot properly interact with other people on stage when you're waiting for a cue or your your head has to go down and find mm -hmm. the place that's on the right. page. You're, you're constantly taking yourself out of the story so that you can find your place in the story. Right. And then you put yourself back in and you're expecting that everybody's going to wait for you while you're doing that. And it completely destroys the tempo of the play. You know, we can, this goes back full circle to what we had talked about earlier about the realism, mm -hmm. right? The the authenticity, the rawness. Mm -hmm. Wait, that can't exist mm -hmm. if somebody has to keep lifting their head up and down, up and yeah. down mm -hmm. to read or and possibly losing their place. Mm -hmm. I've seen readings where mm -hmm. people lift their head from the page and all of a sudden once they go back down, they can't well, find out where I, they I were. I never understood the sense of putting an actor on stage in a book anyway, because if they don't know their lines to begin with, how are they going to know where they fall in the actual book? Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. It's like you're just compounding the problem. It's like they're not, they don't know, well, wait a minute, i got to turn the page. Oh, no, this page. Oh, okay, yes, yeah. and talk about being pulled out of a play, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, you're there for an experience. You're there to, you want to be taken away. You, you literally are paying money so that you can you can be pulled into this new environment. Yes, exactly. And you can't do it. That's right. Once you see them flipping pages yep. or you know they're waiting yep. for a cue, yep. it's over. I know it's tough, but I think it is a tough call for theaters who rely on, they don't have very much time to make their, their money. But in that case, I would just say, cancel the performance. Cancel the performance. Right. Just don't compound the problem. It's funny. It t kind of ties in with another pet peeve of mine about groups who hold auditions for a play they want to do, mm -hmm. and they don't get the cast they need, yeah. but they still do the play anyway. Yeah. I'm like, come on, just be honest about it. Just yeah. say we didn't have the people. Change the play. Mm -hmm. Don't try to do a play with people that just don't fit. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. No, I think um, nowadays, because there is so much theater and probably a dwindling core group of people willing to do the work of producing a play as in acting, uh, directing, etc. you know, the, the nuts and bolts of, of rehearsals and, and things like that. It probably would be better if theaters had not only their main shows, but alternative shows just waiting in the wings. Just say, well, if we can't do Lil Abner, we'll do Pippin. Um, if we can't do this, we'll do this, you know, and just have possibly smaller play in the wings if you've got a large play that you want to do but you don't get the cast or you don't get the people that you need to, uh, for all the uh, you know important things you just say can't do that play yeah i just it's okay to say 
that's can't do it. Thank you. That's yeah. right. It is okay. It is okay. It is okay. But I think a lot of groups go ahead because they don't want to disappoint their audiences. They want they have a certain reputation for doing certain types of plays. So uh, they go ahead and they just make the best of it. And in the end, they come up with, shall we say, a compromised product. Being very diplomatic. Mm. Moving on to controversies, <laughs> continuing in that vein. Oh, goody. Can you tell us a little bit about this whole fiasco with To Kill a Mockingbird on Broadway? What I know um, is pretty much what everybody else knows in, in that um, Aaron Sorkin uh, approached uh, the writer of To Kill a Mockingbird. Harper uh, Lee. Harper Lee. While she was still alive and asked permission to write a new stage adaptation. There had been one written previously that had made the rounds and was doing quite well. It was licensed by Dramatist Play Ser uh, Services. Uh, Dramatist Publishing or Play, I can't remember what it's called. And he eventually got permission to write the new version and it got put on Broadway. And then all of a sudden the producer in conjunction with Dramatist Play Services and Sorkin, Aaron Sorkin, started telling groups across the country that they could not do their version of To Kill a Mockingbird, which wasn't the, the Broadway version, but some convoluted legal nonsense. They owned the licensing while their play was on Broadway. I don't know how it works. I'm frankly still bewildered. But they had control over the licensing rights of the version that had been written before Sorkin ever decided to write his version. And they were shutting down productions all over the country. This is insane. Yeah, Muckford Street Players down in Massachusetts on the Cape, not on the Cape, but on the North Shore, literally had to dismantle their set. They, to, were, yeah. they were days from opening. Jeez. Days. And that's going to be a blow. I mean, it's not just a creative blow, but a financial blow to a company that had already put that into their season and advertised and, you know, then spent the money to, to, to get it up and on its feet and then to be told you can't do it. I thought at first it that's had crazy. something to do with that mileage thing where if you they won't let a play happen within a certain well, I, radius. But I, then I found out, no, that's no, not it, it that's, at all. Because that's ridiculous because Mugford Street Players is 235 miles away from Broadway. <laughs> but um, I don't understand what, what sparked them to do this except greed mm -hmm. because they wanted to drive the audiences toward Broadway. But I am fairly confident that most of the people that want to see To Kill a Mockingbird on Broadway are going to see it, and the people that aren't, aren't. Mm -hmm. And it, whether it's a distance or the price of tickets or the bother of trying to get to New York, booking a hotel room or not, all those things have to come into play. But it's just kind of ludicrous to think that they can drive more people to the theater. And I'm sure that the negative publicity probably did exactly that. Yeah, didn't I They'd, see where groups were voluntarily shutting down their productions yes. or, or saying, you know, screw you, yeah. keep your royalties, yeah. you know, we're, we're not going to do it. And uh, apparently Scott Rudin, the producer, generously relented after pressure was brought to bear that, oh, you can go ahead and do your production. It's like, well, what about the ones that shut down and dismantled their sets? Told everybody, go home, we're not doing this. How do you, how do they get compensation? It makes me very yeah. upset. And they're not going to be compensated. No, they're not going to be compensated. Apparently now people can do the previous version of To Kill a Mockingbird if they want to. Yeah. Scott will let them, which is, you the, know, The great, king has spoken. I think it puts a taint on theater as a whole, but especially that production and the people that are largely blameless, uh, the people that are appearing in the production, uh, you know, the people that are working on that production, you know, the people that depend on a paycheck to get through their own lives. Uh, I think it's grossly unfair what they did. Yeah, it's a terrible disservice, too, because I, I don't know how many people know this, but you have to you have to go and apply to be able to do the play. Yes. And get to get the rights to do exactly. it. Exactly. You have to pay money before you right. make money. Right. Yes. You have to be screened. Mm -hmm. They're not just going to let anybody do it. Nope. So that whole process just gets shelved because somebody had some right. kind of ego trip. Yeah. Shame on them. Yeah. But you kind of reminded me of the thing with Mamet where he. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You couldn't see that. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he had the gall to say that 
productions could not have um, a talk back. talkbacks no. after their show yeah. if they've done one of his show, pr- plays. Yeah, well, Mamet can go <laughs> himself. I know that won't make it to the, you know. Podcast, I'm going to cut that up and keep it at home. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> What's up with that? Um, I just think... I get it if you're going to stick it in people, the middle of the production, you right? Know, Mamet's a gifted, gifted artist. He's He's one of the giants. He really is. Uh, you can't take that away from him. Right. He's no, written some I legendary, agree. legendary plays. Uh, they're part of the American canon. Yep. But the man, I think, lives in a rarefied atmosphere where nobody tells him no. And when he gets an idea, no matter how cockamamie it is, he's got no pushback. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, okay. What have you say, sir? Uh, I don't want anybody talking about my plays. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. I would, as a playwright, I would want everybody to be talking about yes. my plays at any time. <laughs> Amen. And I've written four of them myself. It's like, please, please, invite me up to, to talk about this. I'd, I'd love to. You couldn't pay enough to get people to talk about your play, right? No. And all of a sudden he's saying, I, I don't want anybody discussing it. After yeah. the show's over? No. Yeah. That's insanity. That's crazy. I, if it were me, I mean, you know, I'm a kind of a perverse guy in that respect. When somebody tells me I can't do something, yeah. I'd go out of my way to do it. Yeah. I, I would say, well, I'm going to do your play, and not only am I going to talk about it afterwards, every night I'm going to give you a standing invitation to appear. You would. I know you would. I know you would. <laughs> Send the lawyers. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we, we've, we've touched upon a lot of negative things about theater. Yeah. And I don't want the potential podcasting audience to think that those are the only things that we care about because we care right. about a lot of the things that are are good and true and constant and the the, the faithful people that that uh, lose sleep over how best to present a, a production or a season right. or or anything and and they number in the hundreds here in the state and I want your listeners to understand that that we are extremely grateful because without them we have no reason to be here at all. So even though we're kind of touching upon the things that are a bit negative and it's our duty to do so in a, in a specific way, mm-hmm. uh, we because we must tell the truth. But we also need to focus on the good things as well. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because that brings me to the next thing on my list. Awesome. Which is, what are you looking forward to seeing this year? Um, I'm always looking for the... Uh, the next great story. Yeah. Um, in fact, the last one I saw, the last show that I reviewed was over at um, New Hampshire Theater Project. It was called Charm. Oh, and I saw a story, your review. Yeah. yeah, it was a story of Margaret Fuller, who up until they announced the play, I had no idea existed. And it turns out that she was a contemporary of Emerson and Hawthorne and all of the transcendentalists. And she kind of labored behind the scenes and kind of lapsed into obscurity, died tragically, but lived an absolutely wonderful life, unconstrained by her gender and her station in life. She just went ahead and figured out a way to do what she wanted to do, and she ended up being this really remarkable, remarkable woman. And the story was was told extremely well, was written extremely well by a a woman playwright, and it was produced extremely well and acted extremely well, and I absolutely loved it. I was so drawn in to the story that they told at New Hampshire Theatre Project that I couldn't wait to write the review, and I hope that my review did them justice and they must have thought it did because they've been you know taking snippets out of it here and there and mm-hmm. and using that as part of their advertising campaign for the remainder of the run which is always a nice thing so that's the kind of thing that i look for um there's a theater company over in the monadnock region that is fairly new it's called firelight never heard of them they're very kind of low key they don't have a facebook presence they don't have any social media they've got a website and they update it when they do a show, but they're kind of like, this is who we are, and they've fallen off my radar a little bit, but I happened to stumble across an article uh, in the Hippo about them, and they're doing a play about a lesbian couple and their son, and one of them is a nude model, and this is a play about body images and and unconventional families and things like that. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm thinking that I want to go over and see that. And that's the type of thing that I look for is that that really 
interesting, unconventional type of story. Uh, stories that are written by people, like I said, that are outside of the normal circle of, right. of playwrights whom we come to know and cherish. Yeah. I think one of the best things about the proliferation of theaters in the state is it it has brought about a quality, mm-hmm. a striving to do better. Not yes. maybe one uppance, but they, they see sometimes you kind of forget what what could be done. Yeah, there's um, there's more cross-pollination, I think, now, because of social media mostly, I think, because people can find out instantly what's being done within a, a reasonable distance from them, and they... They couldn't have done that before. Back in the day, when when I first started out, you put a, you may have gotten a, a like a, a notice in the paper, and that was, or maybe a, you know, mentioned on the radio. But your audience was limited by how far the paper went or how far the radio signal went. And uh, but then social media came on and kind of made everything very global. So I know at a moment's notice what's going on in. Berlin or Lancaster or Peterborough or the Seacoast or anywhere in the state, I can find out instantly, instantly is and right. say, I want to see that. Yeah. I want to go to that. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, the problem with that is I see so many of them I want to mm-hmm. see and I can't see them all. No, and neither can I. And that's as an independent playwright with no support at all in terms of, you know, I don't get paid to do this. Yeah. No, I'm not playwright, a critic. As a critic who doesn't both. get paid. I doubt you're getting paid to write plays either. <laughs> I'm not getting paid to do anything. <laughs> but, I could barely uh, get you in here so without my, offering you coffee. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm constrained by the fact that I can't get in my car and, and go see a play a day. And it's almost possible to do that. Right. You know, you could, but yeah. I might have to go to, like I said, like, you know, way up north someday, like North Conway or and then way down south the next day and uh, that gets a little hard on you. So one of the things I was thinking have been mulling over especially this year is trying to find a way to bring more independent critics into the fold oh. with the with the copy act site. I'm not quite sure of the logistics and I'm not quite sure how to do it in a way that it doesn't kind of grind up against some of the more established things like the New Hampshire Theater Alliance adjudications. Mm-hmm. And I definitely don't want to um, step on the toes of, of the established critics that we do have, the, the few that we do have. Yeah. Um, so I've been trying to think of a way to bring some more writers in who could focus on specific parts of the state, like, okay, this the Monadnock's your region, Seacoast is your region, Southern New Hampshire is your region, and just giving them the opportunity to see more plays and to inform more people about them. But again, the logistics are a little challenging. Oh, that would be so hopeful. Yeah, yeah I've, I've done so many plays and seen so many plays yeah. that I wish it had been reviewed. For multiple reasons, mm-hmm. but it, and it's a shame that they don't get the recognition, right? They're mm-hmm. hoping that, I don't know, something will happen and somebody will say something nice about them that they can yeah. get. I mean, that's part of the problem with the hat box. It's not yeah. a problem, but, you know, trying to get a decent audience in yeah. is very difficult there. Concord wants to be like Portsmouth. It's not quite there. Yeah. So there's not that base audience. I got some bad news for you in that regard. It's never going to be like Portsmouth. Portsmouth, by virtue of its geography and the way that it grew up and the way that the city and the arts culture developed, it has a very vibrant art scene for a reason. And it's because of the people and the geography and everything right there. So Concord can certainly borrow from the Seacoast model and Mm -hmm. should because there's lots of good things to borrow about it, but it's not going to be the Seacoast. And I think nobody understands this better than Andrew Pennard, who is the founder of Hotbox, and I want to give him a shout out because I think he's one of the best promoters. He understands what the people in the area are looking for. He understood that we have these big uh, monolithic type theaters in in Concord. We have the uh, Capital Center for the Arts, which is an absolutely wonderful facility, absolutely gorgeous. We have the Audi and we used to have the Anna Carrico Theater here. Yeah, I love that theater. And it was a cute little intimate space, but uh, the city decided to close it down because of safety reasons, and rightly so. But it left the community without that intimate black box type theater mm-hmm. uh, space. And so when Andrew was casting about looking for a performance space for Hatbox, he specifically wanted to stay to that intimate model where it's not as many seats where you could reconfigure the seating or the stage area in such a way that it 
lent itself toward more of the intimate black box experience. So, you know, he's got this, he, he now has that space and he's into his fourth season, I believe, which is wonderful. But he's also a very canny promoter in terms of he knows how to uh, appeal to the contingent that is going to want to see that type of play or that type of performance. It's great to see things at the Capitol Center. It's great to see things at the Audi. Isn't it wonderful that we have those two yes. venues? Yeah. Where they're absolutely wonderful. But if you want to see something that's a little bit more scaled down, a little bit more intimate, then the hat box and the player's ring are those types of places. I don't think intimacy gets enough. Play. It doesn't. It doesn't. I think people think you need to scale up. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to scale down. It's scary, but I think it's very rewarding yeah. when done right. Yeah. Theater Kapow understands that. Boy, That's why they, they do their theater mostly in borrowed spaces or repurposed spaces. In fact, they had not done a proscenium stage production in their existence, in their history, until translations last year. Really? Yeah. And that was a, a staged production of, uh, of That's interesting. Yeah, Brian Friel's play, and they did it as a proscenium play. Now, of course, they brought the audience up closer, so there's still that level of intimacy. Brilliant. But it's still a proscenium production, and it worked on many levels, and I think they probably discovered some things about working on, on a proscenium and whether or not that's going to be a model that works for them in the future or if they want to continue to tweak spaces that they appropriate and make into performance spaces and do so beautifully. It's kind of hard to perform without a home. It is. It is. It's very difficult. But they've done a, a wonderful job. Yes, they it. have. They've, they've definitely adapted. They, yeah. they haven't died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They do wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Matt Cahoon's coming in next week. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it should be a great yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. It's one of my faves. We're running a little long, but I okay. wanted to ask you, what would you like to see in New Hampshire theater moving forward? It's obviously evolved over the years now. What, as a critic or maybe just as a lover of the arts, mm -hmm. what would you like to see? What's, what sits in the back of your mind and you think, man, I hope we can attain this yeah. maybe in a few years? I would love to. I would love New Hampshire to have a full-time regional theater like the Good Speed in New York, uh, in uh, Connecticut. Acts as an incubator for new plays, playwrights, um, and then shepherds them on to Broadway. I would like that here in the wow. state. That's one of the big things I'd really like. That's my big ticket item. I don't even know where to begin about uh, talking about that. What has to happen for something like that to take place? There's a kind of a hierarchy of skills you have to attain. You have obviously have to be an established theater with an established base. You have to have a, probably a pretty significant endowment, which means that you've not only got, you know, really wealthy donors and things like that, but you've got money that's just kind of growing itself. You've got somebody attending to the money aspect of it full time that grows the money so that you can afford to fall on your face if a bad production comes along or if something really untoward happens to your physical plant that needs major investment. You've got that pot of money that you can draw from and it doesn't hurt to take a big chunk of it and go, okay, we'll fix that. Okay, we'll expand that. Okay, we'll put this program in. So we don't have that in the state. We've got theaters that are impressive in terms of uh, their their financial models and their physical models, but they don't have that reserve of cash that's necessary. They also don't have the history. Uh, they don't have the accreditation in terms of the programs they offer or the, the seasons that they offer. Um, they also have to attain certain specifications of theater like a Lort Theater or uh, equity theater um, and take on uh, specific types of professionals or contracts and things like that. And that we have had companies that were kind of on that track, but just kind of got derailed by life happening and things happening and just not being able to realize that really long-term goal of of having that big pot of cash and, and growing their programs. They're doing the best they can with what they have. Yeah, it's a shame to see so many groups, I don't want to say have to beg for money, but this thing about having to fundraise year yeah. after year after yeah. year, 
It's yeah. so taxing. And yeah. you and I both know that there are some very wealthy people in this state sure. who could be a philanthropist or a benefactor to something like this, and it wouldn't even phase them. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, just a shame that that doesn't It is. Happen. I mean, and I think you... you Talk to Katie Collins about, you know, the challenges about approaching the wealthy donors and how to do it. And But even they have finite resources. They may have millions of dollars, but those millions of dollars, they've got to keep in reserve for their own existence or whatever. And I'm sure there's a lot of fingers reaching out for those dollars, Sure there too. are, yeah. But um, there's no easy answer. There's no one answer. But what I find especially encouraging from the, the companies that do the fundraising is they constantly find ways to access funds for what they need and to keep their physical plant going and to grow their programs and to offer programming that's varied and innovative. And shout out to Seacoast Rep. I think they've done a lot of work. They've, they've come back from the brink of, Boy, that is the of, truth. of literal bankruptcy and, and dissolution. And they have moved heaven and earth to address their problems of debt. They, they're, they are on track to becoming debt-free. Uh, they are on track to purchasing the space that they're in. They're on track to growing their endowment, things like that. They are probably the best candidate for the next step of becoming a regional theater because they're full, full-time, year-round, producing house. So, Are they an equity house? Um, I they are not an equity house, but I do think that they do equity contracts from time to time. Um, and I'm not sure how that works, so I, I don't want to speak to that. But, yeah, they're they're considered a full-time professional theater company. And they're small and humble in their way, but they're also huge and impactful. They have a, a huge impact not only in, on the community, but the state and the region, I think. So I can certainly see them becoming a regional theater down the line. And the quality of what they put out is... Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's stunning. Amazing. Well, my friend, anything you wanted to talk about? Well, you asked me what uh, what else I'd like to see. Yes, yes. In addition to, you know, the big ticket item like a, a regional theater, I would love more. I want to see more. And when I say more, I don't mean m- more theater necessarily, but I want to see people taking more chances. I want to see them doing more types of different theater. I want to see more women playwrights. I want to see more trans playwrights. I want to see more plays about trans people, uh, people of color. I want all of those things. I want people, I want the full spectrum of the theatrical experience to always be available in the state. And I want as much of it as I can get. Well, it would be so rich, right? It is. It is now. Yeah. And it's on track to becoming even better. I think as we go forward, you will see uh, kind of a shift away from what we in our age bracket would consider traditional. And then things are going to take the place of those those things that we have come to expect about theater. And theater itself is going to change. And the people and the way that theater is done is going to change. It's doing it now. Mm-hmm. I see it every day. So that's going to end up being a... Um a generational thing, right? Because our generation would write about the things which we know, and yes. it, right. And so, this upcoming generation will massage their sure. playwriting and, and bring in all yeah. of those other stories well, you which know, need you, to be there's told. A, there's a timeline of, of evolution in terms of theater. You know, back in our great grandparents' day, they went to see operettas by Gilbert and Sullivan and Victor <laughs> Herbert, right. and then Rodgers and Hammerstein came along and changed everything in the 40s and the 50s and then Sondheim came along in the 60s and changed everything and then Lin-Manuel Miranda came along in the you know 2000s and changed everything and theater is constantly being turned on its head and and re-examined and it's put in the box and it's taken out of the box and the people look outside of the box and and then they go back to the box and they say let's rediscover this and they go back to some of the old things that our own great grandparents cherished and they they go this is very cool. Let's do a, a revival of, of Victor Herbert or Gilbert Sullivan or, or any of the old cherished names that we uh, have come to know and love. And, yeah. But at the same time, let's add to the list. Let's have more. Let's bring more people to the table. Let's bring more artists to the table and more of their work and more of what's possible. One of the great things about the arts is the passion that's involved. Indeed. It so infiltrates a product. It does. 
it, it, it's, and you can tell when a group or a person has that fire, that passion yes. for that project, it changes everything. It does. It does. It's alchemy. Yes. It's yeah, alchemy. Well put. Yeah. Well put. It's an arcane form of chemistry. It is. And you can't really quantify it except to say that you know it when you see it. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to get into who said <laughs> where that quote's coming from, but... <laughs> But I know it when I see it. I don't know what, but I know what I like. <laughs> what else? Where are we going here? No, you know, I want to continue with the blog as much as I can. I want to see if I can. Did you change uh, the name to what was that? It's still Get off my in the lawn. End. Get off my <laughs> No, that was just an in joke uh, because see. that's one of my catchphrases because I'm kind of a curmudgeon about things and, uh, huh. you know, probably curmudgeonly more about things remaining the same rather than the fact that they don't remain the same. I would rather see more change and more innovation yeah. and more risk. And, it's uh, tough. Change is bit. tough. It is tough. We need to continue on this track of, of exploration, both in theater and as people. Find the things that bring you joy, that spark joy, yeah. as that uh, that lady with the closet cleaning app says. But uh, Well, stagnation will kill us. No, no, yeah. yeah. Uh, find ways to continue to move forward, even if it scares you, is what you need to do. And that goes for me, and that goes for you, too. So I want to find ways to be better at what I do. If I can grow the blog or change it up into something uh, uh, better than what it is that offers value to the community, I will. If, if I have to continue along the track where it's basically just me with a few guests here and there, as I've been doing, then I'll do that. Um, I have no plans to stop doing the critique. I have no plans to stop doing the Granite Stage Facebook page, although okay. I have considered possibly launching a website, uh, which might be more intuitive and user-friendly in terms of gathering the information into specific places, like auditions are all in one section and performances are all in another section. Because of Facebook, it's kind of like you can't really put things in, in specific order. You just kind of have to go with what the, the format that they give you. Yeah, I want to just continue to serve the community as best I can in the capacity that I've chosen and to where my own skill set has led me. I've been approached by a theater company to come back and work with them. I direct once every couple, three years. And, uh, in fact, it's uh, Bedford Off-Broadway. I did Last Night at Ballyhoo with them. I saw it. Liked and I'm um, thinking of doing Women of Lockerbie with them. I love uh, the play. It's a wonderful play. It's based on the uh, Pan Am. The plane uh, crash. Play cra uh, explosion. Oh, explosion. Yeah, yes. explosion. Plane crash over Lockerbie, Scotland. And the remarkable thing about that is that the women of Lockerbie, which is the title of the play, literally gathered up all of the belongings of the people that died in the crash, and they're scattered all over the, the Scottish countryside, and they cleaned them and they returned them to their surviving relatives. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's what the story's about. Wow, so that's fascinating. It's a wonderful story. So there's lots of great stories out there. Yeah, see, yes. Yeah, lots of great stories, and that's one of them, you know? I hate to say it, but it... it I know people have to do Annie, mainly because it <laughs> it's a fundraiser. It, it, it gets money in it the does. in the. It does. But you're right. These are the things that yeah. really they yeah. just get them out there. Yeah. So the challenge the challenge really is to find not only find that story that resonates in the same way as as a show like Annie does, but to present it in a way that it resonates the same way that Annie does, so that people walk away saying, "I loved it." Like they do with Annie. And there's, you know, there's really nothing wrong with Annie. I know. In terms of its value, uh, its production values, it's a, it's a great story in and of itself. It's funny and it's got tragedy and chaos and danger and music and dancing and comedy and tragedy and everything. And it's a time-honored piece of theater and it's based on a well-loved comic. And people relate to that, but... Your assignment, if you choose to accept it, as a producing company is to is to examine all of the things about Annie that make you want to do it. And I'm talking about aside from the fact that it's a moneymaker. Also, finding those points in the story that will make you say, I love this and I love it enough to translate it to an audience and I'm convinced that they will love it too. That is your assignment as a as a producing entity. And that's theater. Yeah, that is theater. In a nutshell. Yes, that's right. Translate your love to, to someone else and let them take it away. Right. Yeah. Tell Michael I said hi. I shall.
I tell him I see every post he puts out there on <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> all of his food posts? Exactly. Yes. Every single one of he them. He doesn't make all of them, which is probably to my advantage. Because he's on fire with that I crazy need, air fryer thing Absolutely. He's got. That's been the healthiest thing he's ever brought into the house. And that's the reason I'm not 450 pounds instead of 350 pounds. <laughs> Oh, I love him. He's so funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank He's you for coming in. He, thank you. Oh, you're, uh, it, was a, it was a real joy. It was a, it, it it was was a privilege. I thought it would I'm be. a big fan of you and your work. Thank you. Thank you very so. much. Thanks for listening. This has been a Square Peg production. And if you'd like to find out more about Square Peg and all that we do, you can find us on Facebook or at www.squarepegnh.com.